Thank you, Drew and Bruce Kim, for organizing this event. Hello, everyone. My name is Mustafa Mahmoud. I'm a translator and a journalist from Egypt. It's my pleasure to be with you here on the International Translation Day. If you think translation is just being bilingual, well, that's not accurate. Like every discipline, and maybe to your surprise, translation is based on a long history, many academic theories and techniques, and is cohesively related to the nature of language and the culture of people speaking it. In this session, we're trying to answer a simple question. How a language and the culture of its native speakers affect the translation process? Or how to solve the resulting untranslatability? In order to answer this question, we will delve into the nature of language, the language families, definitions, and variants. We will also discuss theories and techniques of translation with examples from Arabic, English, Spanish, and maybe other languages as well. Uh, those I mean are three out of the six official languages of the United Nations and some of the largest languages in the world in terms of native speakers. Also, Arabic is my native language, and I studied some Spanish as well. So let's start with the language family. As you can see from this image, this tree image, languages are related. Think of it as a real family. What does a real family have? It has subfamilies, people related to each other more than other people. We have twins, siblings, and lots of people who look like each other, but with different degrees of similarity in terms of both appearance and mentality. A language family works in the same mechanism. That being said, we have related languages and other languages that belong to less related subfamilies. So on the top or the grand grandparent level, we have the Indo-European language, which branches out to the Indo-Iranian and European languages. You can follow all the way to reach modern languages and see how they are related. For example, both Bashtu and Dari or Tajiki had descended from the Indo-Iranian language. English and German had descended from the Germanic language. The That's why we have a lot of similarities between both of them. Just not too far, we find the Romans or Latin languages like Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and French. Those languages share the same structure. They are highly inflectional for verb concord or conjugation and share lots of lexemes or words. But what about the similarities between English and other Latin languages? This is called the Latin effect which leaves traces of, for example, Spanish and French in English due to the historical interactions between nations. So, in the grand scheme of things, what do we learn from this family story? We can see that languages converge and diverge in terms of linguistics and culture as well. So, People who speak Romance languages tend to have more in common than English or Swedish speakers. For example, languages also borrow from each other. So Spanish has more than staggering 4,000 words that stem from Arabic. And 6.5% of the Turkish language is also from Arabic. As translators, we should be aware of the cultural distinctions between languages. So, in these three groups, today, Turkish and Arabs have more in common, but Spaniards and Arabs have almost nothing in common in terms of money, language, but regions wants mentality, to help. 
and the way we think of and perceive the world, even though those Arabic traces still exist in the Spanish language. And those traces are not few. Many geographical names in Spanish are from Arabic, like Gibraltar, Valladolid, Almeria, La Mancha, and even, what do you think, Madrid, their capital, all are Arabic words. Think of the Latin group. It converges among one another, but it diverges from, uh, let's say, uh, the Slavic or the Semitic group, for example. Uh, the Slavic, I mean, that includes Russian and the Semitic that includes Arabic and, uh, and Hebrew. So what is the take home message? While translating a text or subtitling a video product, we should look for those nuances of meaning according to the target audience culture. We should keep in mind that the culture of the speakers of the source language can be completely different than those of the target language. When we realize the possession of each language from one another and determine to which degree the converge and diverge, our render of the text tend to be more natural and readable and not just you know foreign jargon written in the vocabulary of the target language whatever the target language is but does language come in one form no it doesn't language is a huge thing and it comes in many shapes and sizes that fit in the speaker's intended usage we're going to break them down into the most familiar forms And those are our friends. A dialect is a language that is spoken in one area of a country. Take, for example, Cantonese in China or Cockney in London. While an accent is the way someone pronounce words, whether because of where they were born or live or social class, like me speaking English in a foreign accent. Slang is a very informal spoken language, especially within a particular group of people, like maybe young people, criminals, but most probably with teenagers. Like Doge, they take it as a slang for money. Terminology, and we are already familiar with this one as translators, is the technical words that are used in a particular subject, like automotive terminology. Jargon is usually used in a disapproving way, and it is usually understandable within a certain group, and other people might find it hard to understand. Like in journalism, journalists, you know, used to call an archive a morgue. <laughs> Weird enough. A lingua franca is a common language used by certain people in a certain context where people do not share the same mother tongue. So, so for example, I was working a couple of years ago with the Yonamid Peacekeeping Mission in Sudan with people from more than 40 countries, but we all were speaking English. English, though, doesn't have to be the only lingua franca in this world. This could be, for example, Spanish in Latin America, or Swahili in Sub-Saharan Africa, or even Hindi in India. A pidgin is a simplified form of a language created with no native speakers for, to facilitate usually business. For example, let's say two people. One of them travels frequently to the other person's place for business. But both of them, they speak different mother tongues and no lingua franca exists. So they form a common pigeon from vocabulary from both languages and maybe other languages that are common as well. And that is to be able to get one another understood. Now, if those were man and a woman, 
and they fell in love and got married, now their children will pick up their pigeon as a native tongue. In this case, a pigeon stops being a pigeon and becomes the next one, a Creole. So basically, a Creole is a pigeon with native speakers. Vernacular is a native language or a dialect of a specific population opposed to the language of wider communication. So for example, an official language in Namibia is English, but almost every tribe there has its own vernacular. Diaglosia and multiglosia are a result of having a vernacular. Diaglosia is when two forms of the same language are used in different contexts. This is very clear in Arabic, where in Egypt, for example, we talk in spoken Egyptian Arabic in informal contexts. But in conferences, or let's say a formal discussion, we tend to use the modern standard Arabic version, which can sometimes be totally different than the colloquial version. And one of my friends is from Upper Egypt, that is more to the south which has a distinctive accent and dialect than people in Cairo or Alexandria, for example, which is more to the north. So this guy, when he was speaking with us, he's just like us. But when he Skypes with his family, he switches to his beautiful accent. Multiglosia, our last friend here, is almost the same, but with using different languages not just dialects or accents. And this is very common in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Nigeria, for example, there are hundreds of languages. I think 500 or 600, you can check it. And each is usually used in a certain context, like English at schools and the vernacular is used at home. But, What's the language to begin with? A simple question, isn't it? No, unfortunately, I'm sorry, it isn't a simple question. But to begin, let's first focus on live human languages. We're not talking about dead languages with no native speakers, and we're leaving our beloved cats and dogs discuss their own means of communication, whether it's a tail or a whisker, I don't know. Many definitions have been suggested by linguists and philosophers, like those guys. Henry Sweet, the English language scholar, defines language as the expression of ideas by means of speech sounds combined into words. Words are combined into sentences, this combination answering to that of ideas into thoughts. The American linguists Bernard Bloch and George Traeger define a language as a system of arbitrary vocal symbols by means of which a social group cooperates. There is so much to discuss in this matter from these two definitions. But I want to focus here on the aspect of a language boiling down to ideas, thoughts, and a kind of social cooperation. Our perception of the world differs according to many things. The way we are raised up, genes, education, but we were not told that language affects how we see the world around us as well. So, for example, take a very simple word like uncle. According to an English speaker, what comes to their mind when they hear that simple word is different than what comes to the mind of an Arab or a Spaniard when they hear the same word in their languages. In many languages, there are two forms of the word uncle, a paternal one and a maternal one. So, when an American kid hears the word, what comes to their mind may be Uncle John who is the brother of his mother, and Uncle George, who is the brother of his father. But 
in the mind of an Arab or a Spanish or a French kid, what comes to their mind is either this or that, both of them. This also goes with cousin and similar words as well. Our perception of nature also varies according to language. For example, in English, we have a rat and a mouse, but in Arabic, we only have one word for both of them. So what comes to our, our mind when we hear the word is just one of them, not both of them. This is huge. And ultimately, it affects how we translate. Unless we are conscious of these subliminal nuances of meaning, that are related to the nature of language, we can end up with a messed up target language, especially when translating poetry, metaphors, and figures of speech. I'm giving you a practical example from a book I was translating recently about autism from English into Arabic. Well, the book was full of instructions for teachers and parents to correct unwanted behaviors among autistic children. One of those instructions was to keep the kids' attention during the therapy by stopping them from engaging themselves in a self-satisfactory action like playing with their hair or twisting their hands or playing with pencils. So I stopped at the word pencil. What does the author really want to say? Does this mean if the kid is playing with a pen, not a pencil? The instruction is not valid anymore? Of course not. This happens because the English language has either the word pen or pencil. But in Arabic and maybe other languages, we have a neutral word for the tool we write with. And this tool could either be a pen or a pencil by adding a modifier. So. My decision was to go for this neutral word without any modifier. And uh, just to let you know, this method is known as semantic loss, where you drop a component of the meaning to convey it better. <laughs> Sounds weird, isn't it? But it is true in many cases, like with our pencil, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Just a disclaimer. Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. These are two people. Their hypothesis about language relativity is even a hardcore version of how our perception differs according to the language. Worf was working as an inspector for a fire insurance company. And he argued that drums empty of gasoline and marked as empty were more dangerous than drums full of gasoline and marked as full. His argument is, the worker's perception of the word empty jeopardizes with them dealing with less care with the empty drums because the flammable vapor in the empty drums is actually more dangerous than the liquid gasoline in the full drums. The hypothesis is into two parts, a strong one which is almost obsolete and a weak one which is still adopted by some linguists. The strong version says that language determines thought and limits cognition, while the weaker version is that language only affects thoughts. An example, let's talk about colors instead of you know those dry academic words. Green, one of my favorite colors. You know, Peninsular Arabs, those Arabs who used to live in the Arabian Peninsula some 1400 years ago, they used to call green black. Wow, this is huge, isn't it? It's not about the shade of green. And certainly they were not using any Photoshop color palette. So why they were mixing up two distinct colors? Isn't it weird? Well. There is a reason, and this reason is related to their culture and lifestyle as well. 
The Arabian Peninsula, you know, it lies in the exact middle of the solar belt. They are literally baking and sizzling in the sun in an endless desert. So when they see a woods or a green area in the distance, their eyes perceive it as black. So think of how your wife perceives shades of color. Your eyes are not able to catch. It's not your fault. And think twice when translating the word black from an old Arabic scripture. And speaking, we used to have dozens of words for the term desert. And each one has a certain connotation. None of them are the same. So, for example, the word mafaza, which is one of the terms in Arabic for desert, it actually means a victorious blaze. What the hell is this? They call it such as an optimistic way that they will be able to survive crossing this vast swath. that is viewed very easily. And this is because the desert is empty of buildings of, or forests so that you can see through it easily. Compare this with an Eskimo or someone who lives in Siberia or Canada. What is a desert to them? <laughs> Probably it's just a place full of, you know, those silicon pebbles. On the other hand, those people, our Eskimo friends, or Siberian friends or Canadians, they have dozens of distinctive words for snow and ice, which are again unheard of to the peninsular Arabs. An example for verbs is to forgive a sin. In English, what comes to the mind of an English speaker is to give unconditionally. This is completely different than the equivalence in Arabic, which is يغفر, and it is derived from the word مغفر, which means, to your surprise, headgear that protects against swords. So the idea of forgiveness in English is about giving, but in Arabic, it's about the protection Again, it's the consequences of sins. An example from the IT fields is how Arabic speakers and English speakers perceive a very simple thing, modifying a file name. English speakers perceive it as naming a file one more time, while Arabic speakers see it as changing the current name. This way of thinking and perception also affects even the different localities of the same language. For example, a mobile phone versus a cell phone. British people perceive it on the basis of how it is used. That said, the phone can be carried as you go. That's why it is a mobile phone. On the other side, Americans perceive it on the basis of how it works. That said, the transmitter span of coverage, I don't know what does it mean anyway, but it's called a cell. So it's a cellular phone or a cell phone for short. The grammar of the language is also a reflection of how we perceive tenses and how we translate them as well. In English, Spanish, French, and maybe other languages, we have different kinds of the past tense. We have the simple tense, the perfect past, the past perfect continuous, and so on and so forth. And in Spanish, we have el pretérito indefinido, el pretérito plus con perfecto, and many others. And it's in French, it's the same also, the imparfait, the passé composé, etc. But that's not all. We also have moods of verb. We have the indicative, imperative, and subjunctive. 
which is, you know, the subjective one is more prevalent in Latin languages. Unlike Germanic languages, they are almost obsolete. So in Arabic, we only have one past tense. Not very lucky. Actually, the Arabic grammar is very complex anyway. But how we express this plethora of tenses and modes? This is done by adding modifiers and restructuring the syntax of the sentence. Understanding culture and language is a crucial to the translation process. That doesn't mean that languages do not converge. We already said this. For example, Germanic and Latin languages and Arabic share the etymology of the word language itself. It simply means a tongue. But since we're discussing, discussing translation, we have to deal with untranslatability and the distinctive features of each language pair in order to bridge the gap, or at least we can have a shared vision of the world or understand how others perceive it when we read in their languages. And this takes us to our next point, translation theories. Many theories attempt to explain translation, but for the sake of time, we will discuss two similar theories, which are closely related to our main theme. Let me remind you how language and culture affect translation. The first is Eugene Nida's equivalence, very famous, and this breaks down into two. Formal equivalence, and it focuses on the need to pay attention to the form and content contained in the message. And dynamic, or formally, it was called the functional equivalence. So the dynamic equivalence focuses on the message that the audience receives. The second theory is Peter Newmark's approach. And it also breaks down into two. Communicative translation, which attempts to produce on its readers an effect as close as possible to that obtained on the readers of the original. And semantic translation, which attempts to render as closely as the semantic and syntactic structures of the second language allow, the exact contextual meaning of the original. We can see that there is similarity between the formal equivalence and the communicative approach and between dynamic equivalence and semantic translation. But there is contradiction between formal equivalence and communicative approach on one side and dynamic equivalence and semantic translation on the other side. But how to take an informed decision before choosing between the two contradictory methods. Mm, there is no clear cut answer here, actually. Language, you know, is a complex thing. It's related to human nature, the target audience, how the culture of the SL and TL converges or diverges. From our experience, we see linguists who like the first method by sticking to every letter of the source language, and others who like the second method by giving the source language a new facelift. The bottom line here, and in most cases, is to ask yourself, will the reader of the target language understand your translation? We are given examples, but as we said earlier, since we are dealing with untranslatability between cultures and languages, we will focus on when the first method, which favors the source language to the target language, fails to convey a proper or best meaning, or even leads to an incomprehensible or a contradictory meaning. To go Dutch, and since I'm here in the Netherlands, what does it mean? This is when everybody pays for themselves on a group event or sharing the bill among everyone, um, regardless of what you ordered. 
is translated into Arabic as is, to go Dutch. As someone from the Netherlands, nobody would understand it, I'm telling you. And instead, in Egypt, for example, we say in Arabic, to go English. Sorry, British people. Perhaps this came from your legacy during the British occupation in Egypt. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This is the first line of, do you know, Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. Muhammad Anani, the prominent Arabic translator, renders it as, Shall I compare thee to a spring's day? This is a really classic example. Why do Anani translate it, summer as spring? I mean, this is a completely different season, isn't it? But the thing is that in the Arab world, in summer, people are baking and sizzling in an extremely hot sun. So it doesn't have a good connotation. Unlike in the UK, they suffer long, dreary, cold winters. So, simply, if you compare your beloved one to a summer's day, here in the Arab world, probably she's gonna dumb you. This would be a sad ending to the famous sonnet. In the same sense, we can translate the phrase, the news warmed my heart, as the news snowed in my heart. Color, not blue or green. It's a journalism jargon, you know, to add color to a story means to add humanized and imagination uh, elements to the storytelling uh, of, of your uh, writing, copy. But that's in English. In Arabic, it means completely different. It even conveys the opposite connotation. In Arabic, it means, if you add color to a story, it means a biased, or non-balanced story, or non-objective storytelling. So even if you look it up in a jargon dictionary, you may get a wrong meaning. So be careful that even the simplest words may convey an irrelevant meaning, even in the same industry. Sticky fingers. They become, in Arabic, long hands. The goose that lays golden eggs, it becomes the chicken that lays golden eggs. I don't know why. Shining slogans, which is, by the way, a propaganda technique, if you know what I mean. It becomes ringing slogans. Steal your thunder. Snatch the lights from you. Yes, we say it like this. To carry coals to Newcastle. This one is a little bit idiomatic and it needs an equivalent one as well. So, one suggestion is to sell dates in Hajar. Hajar is an ancient city known for quality bound dates, whereas Newcastle is known for quality coal. Black Friday, who doesn't like it? It becomes completely the opposite. A white Friday in Arabic. What does it become white? Because Friday is a holy space day in the Muslim world. The battery. It won't even work in Arabic, I'm telling you. If you're talking about a vehicle battery, it becomes a sleeping battery. Yes, we have batteries that sleep. Why? I don't know. Maybe this is an assignment for the next time. Any other battery, we say it as the battery is emptied from the word empty. So the adjective has changed as well as it turned into a verb. I think it works in Spanish, by the way, doesn't it? Maybe something like uh, la batería está muerte. I don't know. My Spanish is not very well. So if we have Spanish speakers, you may help us as well in this, por favor. Also, an important usage of the equivalence and approach methods, you know, for the kids. 
is the adaptation of cartoons, names of, uh, of characters, I, I mean, uh, names of games, etc., or simply localize them to suit the target language culture. Now we move to untranslatability and problem solving techniques. And let me remind you that untranslatability is a result of language and culture incompatibility that affect our translation process and that we are trying to get around it. There are lots of techniques. Probably the most famous ones are the seven suggested by theorists, Vainai and Ardune. But for the sake of time, we will discuss only five of them. We have two main groups, the direct and the oblique. So, under the direct, we have three. Borrowing is to overcome um, a lacuna. A lacuna is a gap. It's often associated with words that are of, you know, um, maybe traditional or cultural connotation, like sharia, which is uh, law in Islam, jihad, I'm sure this one is pretty famous, there is no equivalence in English for those words, or there is an equivalence that would lead to incomprehensibility to a certain audience. Like, for example, translating jihad as um, maybe a crusade, <laughs> this is catastrophic, of course. It also sometimes, you know, borrowing sometimes creates a stylistic effect. Take, for example, a word like um, uh, ghetto. Yeah, you, you get a certain connotation in your mind when you hear it. And it creates the flavor of the source language, like uh, tortillas in Spanish in Latin America, sushi, I don't know, I, I think it's from Japan. And the word dekr also, uh, which means uh, remembrance of God. And nazar, which means, uh, this one is famous in, uh, in India and in uh, Muslim majority countries that do not speak Arabic, like Pakistan, like in Asia. And nazar means envy. Uh, also sombrero, a word like sombrero, <laughs> especially if it's understandable by a certain audience. So the flavor of the source language is transferred to the target language by borrowing the word and not translating it, even though there is uh, an equivalence. In the legal field as well, Latin and French expressions like uh, prima facie, force majeure, they are excellent examples of borrowing that have been made through time. Some are also taken as is. For example, um, let's say halal or kosher for the Jewish people. It means permissible, but it is, I think it's the best option to keep it as is. And a word like hijab, which means a veil. I think hijab is stronger than a veil. The second technique is the calc, and this one is a bit straightforward, that the expression is just translated as is. For example, handball, or a skyscraper, or recycling, or even nonviolence, or to extinguish a debt, or money laundry. Many, many examples, or even um, to play a role, but, but this one, you know, it's contested actually in Arabic because role has a serious connotation while play has maybe, you know, underrated connotation. Uh, but again, it depends on how the source language audience would perceive it versus the target language audience. Letter translation, you know, this one, I don't know why, but many people think it is a word for word translation. It isn't. But, you know, it, it's a perfect choice for idioms that can be transposed element by element into the target language. You know, some language utterances would translate perfectly to the target language. We may not forget that even though cultures differ, we are still human beings, aren't we? And we have lots of shared universal themes Take uh, return to pitch as an example. This is translated perfectly into Arabic as is. 
except for changing bitch into the plural form. Another example is a white lie, which is perfect. It is translated just as is. Those previous techniques are direct ones. Now, we move to the oblique techniques. And those come in handy in times when the direct translation techniques do not work. And this may be because um, they may be structurally impossible or, you know, sometimes the target language doesn't have a corresponding expression or, and this could lead to that the generated text would have a different meaning or no meaning or even the structure would, would sound foreign. For example, Adam plays football. In Arabic, a verbal sentence is preferred more and hence direct translation is no longer possible. We have to place the verb plays before the subject Adam. This is very common when translating languages where the verb comes late in a sentence. Like um, maybe Turkish, for example. Transposition is an oblique technique that operates on the grammatical level. Adverbs, adjectives, nouns, and so on and so forth. It consists of the replacement of a word class by another word class without changing the meaning. It comes also in two types. A free one, like um, uh, take an example, uh, the course is of interest to all of us. Here, the phrase is of interest. It's translated in Arabic, I mean, it could be translated as a verb or an adjective. The other type is a compulsory one. Like um, the football example we just mentioned. Um, uh, you know, it's also possible when the, the source language and target language have uh, switching possessions uh, of nouns and adjectives, like in English and Latin languages or Arabic, where usually an adjective comes after the noun. For example, Spanish. A black shirt becomes la camisa negra. Negra is, is the adjective here, and it, it's shifted to after the noun. Modulation, it means a change in the point of view. This is very subtle, actually. It may involve a change of grammatical categories. So it is used when the other techniques would generate a text that is co grammatically correct, but unsuitable or you know not idiomatic or just simply awkward. So for example, take the phrase, a simple one like um, maybe no entry in Arabic. Uh, the word no entry, the phrase no entry is correct and it conveys the meaning if translated as is. But it would look weird. A better version would be do not enter. So it became a negative imperative mode and it's not a noun anymore. Another example is, I haven't heard a word from him. It would be more correct to translate it as, I haven't heard about him. One familiar example in localization is, before you can proceed, you must read and accept the terms. Before you can proceed, you must read and accept the terms. In Arabic, it would be something like, you must read and accept the terms to proceed. So that's all, folks, for today. So far, we discussed language definition, variants, and culture, and how they affect our translation process. We also discussed translation theories and techniques to work around and translatability that results from the difference between languages and cultures.
Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it and opened your eyes to different themes that may interest you to dig deeper into. You have my email on my Prusa account. Feel free to reach out to me. And goodbye.